Well, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians in the first chapter. 1 Corinthians in the first chapter, where we're going to read a, a section of Scripture. Uh, normally, I would only talk maybe about one or two verses and kind of expound on those two verses. We're going to read a, a paragraph or so in the first chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And this is a letter that Paul the Apostle was writing to the church, and we'll expound on that. We'll get into some details as we get into that scripture. But as you're turning there, I just want to ask you a rhetorical question. It's a question I already know the answer to because I think it's a question every person tonight can relate to. And the question I want to ask you is, have you ever done something to where you have made yourself a complete fool in front of somebody else? I mean, just like completely far out there. I mean, you wish in that moment you could crawl into a hole and die. Absolute fool in front of somebody else. I say it's a rhetorical question because I think in the course of all of our lives, we've done that. Probably several times, maybe even daily we do that. I was thinking as I was asking that question and, 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 and I was writing, you know, as I was writing these thoughts out what we're going to talk about today, I just want to talk about like thinking, you know, the idea of the subject is like a fool. You know, this idea of what is it to be a fool and, and feeling like a fool. And I was thinking, man, you know, when I ask these questions and I write them out on my notes, I think back to my own times. Like, what are some of the times in which I just completely embarrassed myself? And, and I think one of the times, and, and, it's, and it's not even a big deal, but to me it's probably one of the most embarrassing things that I can remember is, is I was probably about 16 years old. I was courting my, my she's now my wife, Stacy. I was really trying to get her attention. You know, you know that, that if, you, if you can go back to those days of high school or of college and, and if you're married, you know, or you remember those days like as a boy, you, you know, the guys just trying to get the girl's attention or girls, you know, just trying to get that guy's attention, like and in the most subtle of ways. And, you know, they say that, you know, for males that your, your sense of reasoning and your sense of logic doesn't fully develop some, somewhere in your early 20s. And so I was somewhat mentally impaired in that time of life and, you know, I, I'm courting Stacy. I'm really actively trying to get this girl to pay attention to me. And so what I do is I show up to one of the football games at, at her high school. She went to ACA in Redlands. And so there was a football game there. And so I showed up to the game and she was with all of her girlfriends and they were out on the side of the, the football field and I was all by myself. I didn't go to ACA. I didn't know anybody there. I was only there for the girl. And you know, I thought one of the most effective ways to get a girl to notice you is to show off your muscles. You know what I'm talking about, guys? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, let her see your muscles. And when she sees that muscle and when she sees that pure strength, when she sees how cut, how ripped you are, she's just going to be with all her girlfriends over there kind of standing off to the side. She's going to be like, man, that is a fine specimen of a man if I say so myself. Now, mind you, let me give you a little context to this. I was probably about six foot tall at the time, 16 years old, and I, I weighed maybe 145 pounds. So I wanted to show Stacy my muscles because I was just in a stage of life in which I didn't have any fat yet. So I actually wasn't buff. I was just really skinny. So when you're really skinny, you can see definition, although there might not be anything there, but like knobby elbows and bones and, you know, like it wasn't a six pack. It was literally just all my ribs, but I digress. I thought I was strong, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to give this girl a feat of my strength. I'm going to woo her with the muscles, and so right there as we're sitting out there, and everybody's kind of talking, and the girls are doing their thing, uh, there was this fence post, a chain link fence post, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to just start doing some pull-ups right here and just let her know like, this is, yeah, this is it. Yeah, you know, so I kind of go over there and, and I really, I, I'm, I, this is an embarrassing season of my life. I'm really being transparent with you. I'm just want, want you to understand how, how lame this was. I used to wear those athletic shirts. You know, they kind of nickname them wife beaters, but those like really tight tank tops. I thought I was really buff and I would just walk around in those things all day long. I have all these pictures of me in, in, in high school with these shirts on. And so I'm wearing this tank top thinking like she's going to see all my muscles flexing, right? So I grab onto that bar. It's a chain link fence post. I grab onto that chain link fence post, pull myself up, get my chin up on the bar. And I'm like, hey girl, what's up? You know, trying to, trying to show off. Right then the bar broke. 
and I fell square on my back. Just not even like, didn't just fall straight down. Like I was already, because I didn't have enough strength to pull straight up. So, you know, like when you cheat on a pull up and you like kick your legs out. So my body was already like horizontal and then the bar broke and I just, boom, straight down on my back, covered in dirt, big old dust cloud because it was off the side of the field. And she's standing around all of her girlfriends and she's just like, yeah, that's my man. That's my man. She married me even still. Praise God, I got lucky. She was really impressed by that one pull-up I did. And I was so humiliated. I mean, the rest of the night, there was no recovering. You know what I'm talking about when you're that, when you're that embarrassed, when you feel that stupid that there's just like, you cannot dig yourself out of the hole. I really just wanted to be like, hey, I'm out. See you later, you know. I tried, I'm just gonna go find another girl like, cause it's not gonna work. Like, I was so embarrassed. You know, I, I think that nobody on earth, there's not one person on earth that wakes up in the morning and says, man, I just, I really can't wait to get up and make a fool of myself today. Like, I can't wait to go to work and be that awkward guy that doesn't know what to say when everybody else is saying something and I totally just, stick my foot in my mouth. Nobody wakes up in the morning and they look at themselves in the mirror and, and they flex and they say, man, I can't wait to look stupid today. Not a person on earth wants that, ex wants that feeling, wants that expression. But yet life shows us that regardless of our, our avoiding trying those, or trying to avoid those moments, they come at us, right? I find that in our faith, there's a lot of those moments as well. You know, you're trying to talk to somebody. Maybe you're trying to take a stand in a moment or you're trying to, to, to take that higher road. Maybe you're trying to follow that, that wisdom or that advice that Jesus gave of turning the other cheek or of, or of taking the extra mile or going the extra mile. And it seems like everybody else is so far away from where you are that you feel foolish. You feel almost like you don't belong. You feel like you don't fit in. Has anybody ever been there? Anybody ever, when you're know, walking out this journey of faith saying, man, I just, I feel like I don't fit in. I feel like the people that used to know me, I don't, I don't even understand them anymore. I feel like when I show up, I say the wrong thing at the wrong time, and I just would rather not show up. And anybody ever been there before? I'm glad that you're here because tonight what I want to talk about is, is, is some, some advice, some, some direction that Paul the Apostle was writing to this church. And this, this book, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, was actually a letter that Paul, who was this church planning apostle, given this amazing message by God to, to go to the people of, uh, of, of outside of the Jewish faith. We, they called them Gentiles in those days. That Paul would write this letter, and he was writing this encouragement, and this, this church was located in the city of Corinth, and Corinth is in Greece, and Greece is the height of Western philosophy and civilization, and, and, and the, the heights of, uh, of understanding at the time came from a lot of the Greek philosophy and understanding, and, and the depths of introversion, and, and, and looking into oneself. And So Paul was addressing the church, who in, in many ways was feeling this tension between religion and logic. And on the religious side, uh, you know, there were people who were devout Jewish followers of God and they were regularly in the synagogue of the day and they were, they were studious to the word of God. They, they had memorized scriptures and they had new scriptures. And some of these people were not as deep into the understanding of, of the Old Testament laws and scriptures as, as the religious people of those days. And then on the other end of that was, was the, the philosophical people of the city and the people who were very logical, were very smart, were very educated. And, and Paul the Apostle is encouraging the church. He's really exhorting them and, and saying, listen, don't allow this, this momentary feeling of foolishness to hinder or to stop you from doing or to be what God has called you to be. They felt maybe in that time slightly uh, undeserving uh, of going out and talking. Have you ever felt like I'm just not qualified at all to represent Jesus Christ? Anybody ever been there? Well, let me just tell you that the guy on the stage with the microphone today probably feels chief of that. Like, on a daily basis, I look at myself and say, like, how on earth am I doing what I'm doing? I, it's just how we are. We're unqualified to represent Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was perfect, and Jesus was amazing, and Jesus was, was this, the, the representation of God in, in sinless form, and yet we make mistakes on a momentarily basis, it seems. 
And Paul was saying, don't allow this moment, don't allow this feeling, don't allow this inadequacy that you're experiencing because you're not as religious as the religious and you're not as smart as the logical to stop you in this walk and in this journey of faith. And so here I want to pick up in, in this exhortation, in the beginning words of, uh, of Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians in the first chapter, verse number 18, Paul the Apostle talks about it and he says, verse, he says this, he says, for the message of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. And this is a, a stark word. And we look at the cross today and we understand that the cross is the international symbol of, of Christianity, of our faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, you know, there's campaigns out there started by some great churches like Hillsong that, 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 that paint images on, uh, in the sky or put social media tags out there that, that have cross equals love. You know, the cross is the symbol of love to humanity. But in, in, this, in the day of writing this, the cross was not a glorious symbol. The cross was not the official symbol of Christianity. That didn't come for 200 more years in history's time. The cross was a symbol of torture. The cross was a symbol of death. The cross was a symbol of, of agonizing pain represented by following Jesus Christ. And this was a church and this was a group of people who in following Jesus were experiencing persecution. They were experiencing the belittlement of the community around them. They were experiencing the, what, it, what it is to no longer fit into the society that they once fit into. And Paul says that the message of this cross, this torture device that we look at and we see as salvation, salvation because of what Jesus did on a cross, that he became sin for us so that we could be free from the weight of sin and shame. He says that this is a, a message of foolishness to those who are dying, to those who are perishing. And that, that word is dying spiritually, who are disconnected or unconnected from the, the, the light or the salvation of God. They don't understand it. When we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus, people don't get it. They don't see it. It's foolishness to them. And he says, but it is to us who are being saved. And what, what amazing language that is. Not to us who are saved. But to us who are being saved, who are walking in this journey, in this, in this process with Jesus Christ of internal transformation. That as we look at ourselves and we begin to see subtle and slight changes. Have you ever been there where you think, man, I followed Jesus. It should be fast, right? Like, I shouldn't be thinking these thoughts anymore because I follow Jesus, right? To us who are being saved, thank God it's a process. Thank God Jesus came full of grace and truth. Thank God that we take one step at a time and we walk our journey out one day at a time, one moment at a time. And so Paul says to us who understand the price that was paid on this cross, this is a message of power of God. This is a message of the realization that God is so much greater, that God is so much bigger than what the world has to offer. And if I don't know if you've noticed, but in, in our world and in our society today, it seems as though we speak and we, we address, or you hear people speak and address science as though it is already scientifically, scientifically proven fact that God is no longer relevant and that, that these are factual things that, that creationism and, 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 and the, the belief in a deity is just the, the conception of human intellect. And, and they speak as though Christianity is this little, tiny, closed-minded, bigoted group of people in the world who are completely irrelevant to all things outside of their little bubble of faith. And so there's this, there's this tension we feel in this society today. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you go to school systems and the educational systems, if you have children who are in college or if you yourself are in university or have gone through that, you've been challenged likely in your faith in some of these programs and some of these classes and some of these systems uh, and the ways of approach. And, and the way and the world in which we live is very similar to what the Corinthian church was experiencing and feeling in those days as well. That the Christians, these followers of Jesus, were these closed-minded, weird, secluded, 
exclusionist type people that would meet in secret and they were so misunderstood. I mean, at the time of writing this, people would think that because they were having communion together, and if you've never partaken or been a part of communion in church, we, we read the words of Jesus that he uses, that, 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 that a glass of wine is the representation of his blood that was spilled for us or poured out for us on that cross, and, and a bread, the piece of bread is a representation of his body that was broken for us. And so they would have communion. People would, would, would accuse them of being cannibals because they didn't understand. And they would gather together and close doors and they would drink blood and eat flesh. And they would have these feasts uh, on the end of the week and they'd gather together and, and have potluck dinners. And they would call them love feasts because they were doing so in the love of Jesus. And people would accuse them of orgies and, and all sorts of promiscuity. And so they were so misunderstood and so misrepresented. And so Paul is talking to this church saying, nobody seems to get you. And it seems like the faith in which you believe, the, the actions in which you walk, everybody else looks at you and says, you are acting like a fool. But we understand. We understand because we've seen the light, we've seen the power, we've seen the reality, we've seen the salvation, we've experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, that this is power, that this is life, that this is God moving on the inside of us, and it is not foolishness to us, but it is to the world. And then we find ourselves today in this dichotomy, in this tightrope of our faith, of wondering, how do I go through the course of walking out my faith when people who don't understand me think I am a fool? When speaking to somebody about my faith on the job or, or sharing, sharing my experience or my story with somebody who, who's been going through something and, and knowing that they don't believe right now and they might belittle that or they might say, well, that was just this or that was just that and try to, to play it down and makes us feel like fools. And what it does is exactly what it did to me when I fell off that bar trying to do a pull-up. It makes us want to crawl into a little hole and hide from the world. And Paul goes on and he quotes this Old, section, Old, Old Testament uh, saying or psalm and he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the, the understanding of the prudent. And God goes on and he says these words as he quotes, he says, for where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message being preached to save those who do believe. So Paul's saying that it wasn't intellect that brought people to Jesus. It wasn't science that proved that that, that people could see Jesus. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, great philosophies that brought people to, to the faith in Jesus Christ. It was the inexplicable, simple things of God. God didn't use the great theologians of, the, of these days, the great people or the great uh, uh, men and women of, uh, of, of position to preach the gospel. God used simple men and women. Regular people like you, like me, to change the face of the world. There was a, there was a, 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 a critic of the, of the early church in the first century. And this critic's statement to faith and the reason, and he was a Greek critic. And, and, and his criticism of Christianity said these words. He said, Christianity is for the weak-minded and for the woman. Now, in today's day, nobody would ever get away with saying something like that because it is incredibly a sexist statement. But in those days, women were considered to be greatly lesser than men. Women weren't allowed to attend educational institutions. Women weren't allowed to have uh, uh, um, the education that men would have. They had their duties. They were generally domestic duties. And so... His criticism uh, of, of Christianity was for the weak-minded and for the woman, so to say, the, the, those who are lesser in society. And I love that because, you know what, in that day and age, that's what it was for. 
And God used the weak, and he used the low, and he used the uneducated, and he used the simple person to bring about great and marvelous things in this world. Why? Because it wasn't their smarts that changed the world. It was the reality that they saw they were living in a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and that when they presented that to people, people could see the conviction. They could see the spirit of God. They can see the inside of them in their heart and there was no way you could remove this from these men and from these women. There's this story in the book of Acts of Peter and John and they're before the great religious council called the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem and the council is trying to tell them stop preaching about this guy Jesus like speak about God all you want but this, this man that you claim to be Messiah Jesus it's causing a problem. And as they began to argue these statements, and as they began to argue this, Peter and John were arguing this, they, they, they kind of stepped back from their, their position, and they realized that these men, even though they were simple, uneducated men, had been with Jesus, because their answers contained so much depth, so much wisdom, so much insight, that they realized that they could not hold an argument against these men. And I believe that that's what God does for you and I. And so Paul goes on and he says, and, and he says that he says, for the Jews, they request a sign. And, and, and for the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. And here is the juxtaposition that Paul is presenting. He's, he's not belittling uh, an ethnic or religious group, and he's not belittling an intellectual or, a, or an ethnic group in the Greeks. What Paul is saying is that the Jews represent the height of religion. This is the world's only monotheistic faith at this time. And these people knew the word of God. They were trained to memorize the Torah by the age of 13. They could recite it. They sang it. They did all the different things that they had to do. This was the peak of religion. And he says, so in the peak of religion, they want a for sure sign from God that Jesus is who he says he is. And on the other end of the spectrum of religion, there's logic. There's the understanding of the world. There's the height of education. And the education, the educated say, we want to see this in light of philosophy. We want to see this in light of degrees and of education and of light of arguments and debates. And Paul says these words. He says, but we... You and I, we're not the religious and we're not the logic. We're not the philosophers. He says, but we, we are regular people. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Why? Because they don't see the signs. And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. Why? Because we don't argue according to their logic. But he says these words again, he reiterates that, and he says, but to those who are called, to both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. You see what he said right here? I don't know if you catch this. I don't know if you catch this. Jesus is the fulfillment of what both sides look for. See, he says the religious are looking for a sign. Jesus is that sign with power. He says that signs, wonders, and miracles will confirm the word of the Lord to the apostles and to the disciples. And if we read the book of Acts, that wherever they went, there were signs, there were wonders, there were miracles. People would, would, would fall under the shadow of just Peter, and the Spirit of God was so thick and so heavy on Peter that they would find healing in that. Paul the apostle would touch a rag, and they would send that rag to other people, and they would touch the rag that Paul touched, and they would be healed, and demons would leap out of people, and, and people would come to know God, and all these things were happening. This power, it's the sign that people were looking for. And, and with the wisdom, Paul was there in Athens in the height of Greek philosophy. And he finds the inroads to arguing a, a column and a pillar to, that the Greeks didn't want to offend gods. And so they had a column to an unknown God just in case they forgot one. And Paul says, it's this God I want to talk to you about. This is the God above all other gods. And he begins to argue with them and he begins to debate with them according to their own reasoning and according to their own logic. So Paul says to those of us who see the light of Jesus Christ, we understand that he is the fulfillment of wisdom and he is the fulfillment of power through God. And I love what he ends this, this section of scripture with. And he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God 
is stronger than men. See, what the reality is, is that when we live in Christ, when we operate in the kingdom of heaven, we realize and we understand that it's not us. It's not our qualifications. It's not our intellect. It's not the amount of degrees we might hold. It's not the, 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 the intensity of religion we might follow. That as we fall into Jesus and as we dive deeper into a relationship of understanding who this man Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us, that God gives us his wisdom and that God gives us his power. And that in that, the foolishness of God, God on, on God's worst day, which I don't think he has one, but on God's worst day, he's still better, he's still greater, he's still stronger than any of us on our best. And we lean to that. We lean to that. And so Paul's encouraging them, don't, don't allow the world, don't allow those who don't understand you to stop you from doing what I've called you to do. To shine the light of the glory of Jesus Christ. To be a witness to the ends of the earth of the goodness and of the love of God to those who are perishing and need to hear. You see, each and every one of us has a place and a position in the kingdom of God, a role in which we must fill. And I believe that faith, faith will challenge our logic and it will challenge our religion. Wait a minute, I thought faith is religion. God did not send Jesus Christ to die on a cross, to add another checkbox on a survey of what religion we identify with. See, religion is about rules. Religion is about regulations. Religion is about measuring up to the bar. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you realize you never measure up to that bar. You'll never measure up to that bar. If you think you measure up to that bar, I hate to kick the soapbox out from underneath your feet, but guess what? You're human. Praise God, because you're like everybody else, and that's a good feeling. We love to be unique in this day and age, but you know what? Sometimes it feels good to know that I'm just like everybody else, and I make mistakes, and I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. All right, get off my soapbox. And it's not our qualifications. It's not our strength. It's not our abilities. It's, it's not our intellects. It's not our knowledge. It's Christ in us that does this. And our faith in Christ will challenge our intellect and it will challenge religion. And God says, I don't want you to be on the ditch of the ultra-religious and I don't want you to be the ditch in the ultra-philosophical. But I want you to be in this position of relationship with Jesus Christ that when you live this world and that when God beckons you and when God calls you and God sets something upon your heart to go and do something, you might feel like a fool. But don't let that stop you from doing and being who God has set you to be. Because you know what the beautiful thing about the text that we call the Bible is? is it's full of people that I think in the moment of what they were doing, felt awfully foolish. I mean, think about it for a moment. Maybe you're familiar with some Bible stories. I, I would imagine that, that Noah felt really stupid building a boat in the middle of a desert with no water around. And everybody mocked him. And you know what? It took Noah several hundred years to build that boat. It wasn't like a two-week process. If you've ever seen Evan Almighty, like he built the ark in like two days, you know, sorry, <laughs> it didn't work that way. So imagine feeling dumb for a couple hundred years, right? I imagine Moses probably felt somewhat dumb, leading people through the Red Sea, through the miracles of God out of the exodus of Egypt, and they get there and they just watch Pharaoh's army you know, obliterated in the ocean and everybody, millions of people likely are asking Moses, where are we going? Well, guys, I actually don't know. But God's going to take us there. You know, I would think that David probably felt a little silly going against a really big giant with just a couple of rocks in his hand. I think that Elijah might have felt in a moment somewhat foolish, dumping water on top of an altar and forgetting to even bring a match 
to light it on fire. Not only did he make it harder to light on fire, he didn't even have anything to light it on fire, and he needed God to bring fire from heaven. I think that all throughout the scriptures, we read all through the New Testament, there's a lot of people that did things, and I think in that moment, they felt awfully foolish. They felt awfully silly. They felt like it didn't make any sense, that it was challenging in that moment their logic. It was challenging their religion. It was challenging who they were. But God was saying, I want you to step out of your comfort zone. And I want you to do something that you might feel dumb doing it. You might feel like a fool doing it. You might look like a fool. But if you'll do it for me, I tell you, something's gonna happen. And, 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 and I just want to encourage you. I have a couple of minutes left and we're done. And I want to encourage you by sharing with you, I think, one of the most fascinating stories of a man who looked like a fool. His life was chronicled failure after failure after failure, but yet God used him in such amazing and mighty ways. And this man's name is Peter. And if you've got your Bibles, we're just going to end on, these, on this section of Scripture. I'm only taking you to two today. That's it. So simple, so easy. There's this amazing story. In Matthew, the 14th chapter, Matthew is one of the followers of Jesus, eyewitness accounts of Jesus. And Matthew chronicles and he writes these, these, these accounts of Jesus. And Matthew, the 14th chapter, was this kind of up and down emotional chapter, a season of Jesus' life. In the beginning of that, Jesus' cousin John was beheaded. It was a hard moment for Jesus, and he, he, and he had a hard, he had a heaviness about that. Right after that, Jesus went to be alone to kind of process through that, and people followed him. And right after that was this tremendous high in which there was probably ten to fifteen thousand people on the hillside, and Jesus preached a sermon. And and in that sermon, people were listening, and they were there all day. It was like a conference, and the disciples come to Jesus and say, "It's late. There's nowhere to buy food. Send people home." And Jesus says, "Feed them." So Jesus feeds 5,000 men, not including the women and the children. Right after that, Jesus says, hey, guys, I want you guys to go right over there to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I'll meet you there. I'm going to go, and I'm going to pray and spend some time with God. And so the disciples, they get into their boat, and they start to go across this, this, this body of water. It's not very big. It's not, it's not an ocean, if you would imagine an ocean. If something's called the sea, it's not that big at all when you can see across the other side. And so Jesus says, I want you guys to go there. Like you can actually see, like there's where you're going to go. But what happens is the desert brings these strong winds, and these strong winds, they blow hard across this sea that's mostly tranquil during the year. And every once in a while, these great winds come, and these winds cause great currents, and, and, and water starts to stir, and the waves become boisterous, the Word tells us, the Bible tells us. That's such a cool word, boisterous, isn't it? It's a word for the day if you don't use that, trying to figure out a way to boisterous, vigorous, violent. So the waves, the storm rolls up and the disciples are a little scared. It's late in the night, very early in the morning. And Jesus decides that I'm going to go meet them. Well, how does Jesus decide to go meet them? He doesn't take a boat. He decides, I'm going to walk. But it's a long walk around the lake, so I'm just going to take the shortcut. You ever try to take a shortcut? It doesn't work out, right? But for Jesus, it does. So Jesus walks across the lake. So Jesus defies gravity. He's walking on the water. And there at the late night hour, the, the, the third hour of the watch, or the hour of the third watch, the disciples are out there. They're rowing. They're just trying to keep the boat moving in the direction that they need to go, fighting the current, fighting the wind. They see a figure. Put yourself for a moment in their place. Never in the history of humanity has there ever been somebody who has stood on the surface of water and not fallen through it. You've tried it before. Don't lie. You tried. You were probably a kid. Maybe you even said, I'm going to stand on the floaty in the pool and just see what it felt like to stand on the water. And you fell right over and you fell in the water. But here they see in the distance a man wearing a light-colored tunic. So think about it. Light-colored tunic. In the night watch, in the night, illuminated by what little moonlight there is shining through, what do they think? They think the same thing you would think. It's a ghost. Doesn't even mean they believe in ghosts. What other explanation is there, right? So Jesus tries to set them at ease, and we're going to pick up here in Matthew in the 14th chapter. Matthew in the 14th chapter, they, they cry out in the fourth watch of the night. Jesus says that, and they say, it's a ghost. In verse number 27, it says, but immediately Jesus speaks to them. He says, be of good cheer. Hey, guys, chill out. It's all right. It's me. Okay, cool, Jesus. Glad to know it's not a ghost. Wait a minute. You're standing on water, right? Like, 
They're, they're probably pinching themselves. They're probably, I mean, come on. These guys are human, right? You, we see things in hindsight. So we're like, oh yeah, of course Jesus is standing on the water. Think about them for a moment. Put yourself in this position. They're looking at Jesus standing on water. Not only is this water, this is like wind and waves, uh, rough water. Their boat is almost sinking water. This is, and Jesus is like, it's me. Don't worry, guys. I, I, I'm okay. And they're like, you know, Jesus, get in the boat. Like, what are you doing? You're gonna... and, and, and here's what I want to show you. I think it's just one of the most fascinating stories that the Bible has to say. Is there's this man. His name's Peter. I love Peter. I love Peter because I think Peter is, is this image of everybody. Peter is like everybody relates to Peter. Why? Because Peter was like one of the most imperfect guys that God did such amazing things with. And, and this is a, a moment for Peter. And Peter says these words. He says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out under the water. Okay, pause, right? Once again, try to put yourself, remove hindsight, remove the familiarity of the story. Put yourself in the middle of a boat, in the middle of the night, sinking, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're seeing somebody stand out in the middle of the lake, and you say to them, invite me to go to you. Catch where we're going with this? Like, Talk about feeling stupid, right? So Jesus responds to Peter, and he says, come. And Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on water to go to Jesus. The story goes on, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, there's that cool word, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretches his hand out and catches him and says, oh, you of Little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt, Peter? I was there. You were walking. You were doing it. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. What a phenomenal story this is. When we're talking about the subject of stepping out in faith that challenges our religion and the challenges our logic, makes us oftentimes feel like fools, here's probably one of the low moments of Peter's walk. Because this story is forever chronicled as Peter's failure or lack of faith. But I want to point something out to you. Because yes, Peter failed. Yes, Peter sank. But I want to point something out to you. That Peter says these words. He says, Jesus, if it's you... Bid me to come out to the water and meet you. And Jesus says, come. And he got out of the boat and he walked on water to meet Jesus. Now think about this for a moment. This story is always, always, always described as the failure of Peter's faith. But it doesn't say that immediately he sank. That Peter got out of the boat and he walked on water. Talk about a Thanksgiving dinner conversation, right? Like people are talking about their accomplishments and their accolades. You know, I did this and I did that. And well, I've experienced the height of this. And well, I summited Mount Everest without oxygen. And then there's Peter. Well, I walked on water. <laughs> Top that. He walked on water. He actually walked on water. The only other human being in the world that ever walked on water was Peter. Shortly thereafter, he might have briefly walked on water. might have been a step. might have been two. might have been like what, what Woody in Toy Story describes of buzz. That's not flying. That's falling with style. It might not have been walking with water. It might have been falling in style. But either way, Peter is written in the text of God that he walked on water. And then I love this because we see Peter's failure. He sinks and Jesus grabs him. But I want to point something else out to you really quickly. And it says that Jesus says to Peter, oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And then it says that Peter and Jesus got into the boat and the wind stopped. And then I have this highlighted. I want to emphasize it in verse number 33. Then those who were in the boat, those who were in the boat, those who were in the boat. I wonder, what is God calling you and I out to? What is Jesus calling you to in life? 
Like Peter who says, if it's you, beckon me to come. And Jesus says, come. What is it in your life right now in this moment that Jesus is calling you to do? Because I guarantee you, it's going to be outside the confines and the safety of the boat. And what I wonder about myself and what I wonder about you is when Jesus calls us, in light of what we're talking about with Paul the Apostle saying, we realize and recognize that people don't understand and we feel dumb sometimes in this faith walk outside of church when we don't fit in. But will we be people like Peter? Or will we be like the others who stayed in the boat? Because think about it for a moment. Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, come, open invitation. But everybody else in the boat was like, not me. I ain't going to do that. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to be the guy that, that falls for the hallucination or for the mirage or for the, the, you know, the, the little, the, 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 you know, the image that we think we're seeing. But Peter says, no, you know what? I will risk looking like a fool to go where Jesus tells me to go and to do what Jesus tells me to do. Because if I have to look like a fall, fool, I know all along that Jesus is there beside me. Because yes, Peter failed. Yes, Peter sank. But before Peter fell all the way in, Jesus already had his hand. And so when God calls you out, when God calls you to do something that is beyond your comfort zone, that is beyond your logic or challenges your sense of religion, well, church isn't done that way or people don't share their faith that way or, or you know, it doesn't go that way or it doesn't work that way, but Jesus says, come. Will you be and will I be the person that says, forget it, YOLO, and get out of the boat and risk looking like a fool rather than staying in the confines and saying, wow, there's really something to that. If you don't know what YOLO means, YOLO is an acronym for you only live once. All right, it's this young thing. So the question is, what is Jesus calling you to do? And will you risk looking like a fool to do it? Will you risk looking like a fool to do it? Because what I think is so amazing I was talking to Pastor Joel today about this. We were talking about the message. I think this was the setup of Peter's ministry. Because Peter was the only one that got out of the boat. A couple of chapters later, Jesus asks everybody, who am I? And it's Peter that says, you're the son of God. Wait a minute. Chapter 14 already said, truly you are the son of God. Nobody answered then. Why? Peter said, hey, man. I'll look stupid again. If I answer wrong, oh well, at least I'm doing something. I'm stepping out. So Peter says, you're the son of God. You're the, the Messiah of God. And Peter says, you're, Jesus says, Peter, upon you, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus, after he's resurrected from the grave, Peter's out there fishing again and he sees Jesus and he recognizes that as Jesus. I think, I think Peter thought he was going to walk on water. In John, the 21st chapter, it tells us that Peter puts on his coat. Who puts on their coat to go in the water? Peter, put, Peter puts on his coat and jumps into the lake again. And everybody else takes the boat to shore and Peter swims. I think Peter was shocked when he landed on the water and didn't, didn't walk again. And it was Peter who was the spokesperson to thousands of people on the day of Pentecost that brought thousands of people to the light of understanding of who Jesus was. And it was Peter who was the leader of the church in the, mo in, in, in the beginnings of it. It was Peter who even today the Catholic Church considers to be the first head or the first leader of the church, the first pope. It was Peter. And I think it all started with a man who said, you know what, I might look like a fool getting out of the boat in the middle of the night. But if Jesus says come, I'm going to come. And so what is, because every one of us, and we're done with this, what is Jesus calling you to do? Because at every moment, 
at every place and in every stage of your life, Jesus is there beckoning you, come, come out into the deeper water. Come out into the place where it doesn't make any sense. Come, follow me, come. And what is he calling you to do? Is he calling you to share your faith with that person that you know needs to hear? Is he calling you to to join that community organization to make a difference or an impact in your community? Is he calling you to say no to the next time somebody offers to buy you the next round of beer and say, you know, I'm good, I'm set. Is he calling you to go the extra mile? Is he calling you to turn the other cheek? Is he calling you out? He's calling you to something. And the question is, what is he calling you to? And in that question, why, why, why are you still in the boat? Because I love how Paul ended that section of Scripture. Paul says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And you might be in the confines of safety, saying, I'm not sure I can risk that that reputation or that feeling or that moment. I don't want to end looking like a fool. I imagine Noah felt dumb. I imagine Moses felt dumb. Can I tell you something? I imagine Peter had his moments where he felt silly. And I even think there were moments in the humanity of Jesus as he was stuck to a cross, naked, that he felt, what am I doing? What is going on in that moment? But yet he risked it. He got out of the boat for you. The question is now, will you, will I, will we get out of the boat? to risk feeling like a fool, knowing that no matter what we do, we might seem like fools to the world. But I rest in the fact that God fulfills my intellect and God fulfills my strength. And I'll step out of the boat if Jesus says, come, I will go. That's it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your encouragement. Lord, I pray that tonight somebody here Lord, somebody watching online or somebody on the podcast tonight, they needed to hear the encouragement that you are calling us out, calling us to stand in faith. Faith doesn't bury its head or bury our head in the sand. Faith doesn't ignore the facts. Faith simply introduces you into the equation of the impossible. So, Lord, I pray that as we look at what might be impossible, things like walking on water, things like standing in faith, things like believing for miracles, things like, like, like shining the light of the kingdom of heaven, God, I pray that you would beckon us to the deep. Lord, I pray that you would call us, and I pray that you would strengthen us, and I pray that you would encourage us to be and to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said amen. Amen. Did you guys get something out of that tonight? Cool.